not, then we'll have a very cozy uh, session. Uh, feel free to ask any questions you want as we go along. Uh, if something's not clear, something is not um, explained very well, then let me know. I'll try and explain a little bit more. And I'll be around today and tomorrow as well if you've got any more questions about uh, closure or anything else I do as well. Um, so this is, uh, ooh, this is not switched on, there we go, this is me. Um, I work for Salesforce when I'm not uh, doing conferences and um, you can follow me on Twitter and I've got some websites as well which kind of help people get into uh, learning uh, happening in the system that you have to try and decompile in your code. You have to basically walk, walk through an awful lot of code to be able to understand what's actually going on in the overall system. It becomes quite uh, a complex uh, kind of thing that happens with your code. And while your computer is fine, perfectly fine at actually creating uh, and dealing with complex code, then actually as a developer, it's really tricky. And so you get this uh, thing, there's this uh, concept called the, um, uh, the complexity iceberg, because what you see when you look at your APIs, when you look at your code, you kind of see this top little bit of the iceberg. You can look at the APIs, you can look at the method signatures that you've got, the the, the functions that you're calling, and you can kind of get some idea about what your program's doing. But until you actually walk through each line of that function, you might not know what actually what's actually going on when that function actually runs. So one of the ideas of functional programming is to try and kind of minimize the complexity by minimizing what's actually going on there, especially in terms of changing state as well. Um, if you start changing state uh, outside of the function you're working in, or if you're pulling in other state changes that you're not aware of, then it can be quite uh, difficult to reason about what's going on in your project, in your program. So I kind of drew this to kind of help visualize what's going on. So we've got our function that we've defined. This could be a function, it could be a method in, in Java. And it might have arguments. So we're giving it some parameters. When we call it, we call it with uh, maybe a string or a number. So we can see what those are. We can see what the arguments are we're giving to a function. Uh, and we can see what the result is of that function as well, unless it's, uh, unless it's no result. Uh, but we can kind of see um, what's going in and what's going out. And if that's all we're doing, then it makes it a lot easier to reason uh, about the algorithm that's inside our function. But if we're pulling in things from the outside world, we're pulling in other information, other data from the inside world, we can't really understand what that is unless we actually read through every single line of our, uh, of our function. And the same thing with side effects. If we're actually changing things in the wider project, in the wider code, uh, outside of our function, then, again, we can't necessarily realize what's actually going on when we just read a part of our uh, application. So we've got uh, an example here to try and make it a bit more real. So this is a bit of closure code. I'll go through some of the syntax in a moment. Uh, but essentially, we've got, um, we're defining a function. We're using this defn uh, function to define a function. And we give it a name called increment numbers. And we're giving it an argument. The argument's in uh, square brackets called number collection. And simply what we're doing is we're going to um, increment all the numbers in that collection. So we're just going to uh, map over each of these uh, numbers that we're going to give. So um, this is us actually calling the function. So we're calling the function by its name, and we're giving it uh, an argument of a just a collection of integer numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so this, this line of code basically calls this function, uh, and we get this result. So you can see this is our input, this is our, our argument, and this is our result. So if we just looked at these 10 numbers, we could actually very easily reason it's, I know it's a simple example, but we can very easily reason what our algorithm actually does. It essentially adds uh, uh, one to each, each of the numbers, each of the number of arguments we give. So it's very simple, uh, and it's very easy to kind of reason about this code. Uh, if we take another example, uh, it's the same, um, it's almost the same algorithm. Uh, what we're doing is defining another name for a value. So we've got this other collection here of 54321, and we give it this name called global value. Uh, and we're going to call this function again uh, from here. And we're going to pass 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But this time we get 654321. So that's not actually incrementing the numbers. It's actually uh, doing something very different. 
And when we actually go and look at the actual code, we're here, instead of using number collection, the argument, we're actually using, uh, we're pulling in a value, we're doing like some data uh, injection, uh, we're pulling in this argument that's outside of this function, so we're actually getting an unexpected uh, uh, result because we're pulling in, uh, we're not getting this value updated, we're getting this value uh, updated as well. So when we do impure functions, when we do functions that are pulling in information from other sides, uh, other parts of the world, it makes it harder to think about what it's doing. And even this is just a simple example. If you uh, have much more real-world code, then it gets even more complex to think about what it is you're actually uh, doing with that code, what your code is actually going to do. Uh, so one of the, the main things uh, functional programming tries to do is to, to minimize the, all these like, side effects and side causes. So if you can keep your functions as pure as possible, then it just makes your, all, all your code base a lot simpler to actually understand. Oh, we found some more people. Come in, find a seat. Um, so let's just a little bit about Clojure itself. Uh, so Clojure is a general purpose language. It's a modernized version of, of Lisp. And essentially, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's more or less the same as Lisp if you've come across that language before. Uh, it's, the syntax is a bit more modernized. But it's a hosted language, so it actually runs on top of Java or .NET or, um, or even JavaScript as well. So you can actually generate JavaScript code from Clojure, uh, just like you would do if you're, you're, if you're using JavaScript 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10. Um, you're actually transpiling that into JavaScript 5, so it'll actually run on all the browsers. Um, and you can do the same thing with Clojure, uh, and then we call that Clojure Script, but it's essentially the same language. Um, and obviously, you've got uh, interoperability with the host language as well. So if you're, doing, uh, if you're doing Java, then you can call things like Java Util Date. If you're doing JavaScript, then you can call like, JavaScript Alerts or any other JavaScript libraries that are, um, you want to include in your project. So it's quite adaptable. I've seen, even seen people uh, writing Clojure script inside for, for doing Excel um, spreadsheet um, uh, little macros. Uh, so there's quite a, it's quite an adaptable language. And for this talk, basically, this is the syntax we're going to cover, so it's not really very much at all. Um, so we've got the round brackets denote a, uh, a, a list, in this case an empty list, because there's nothing in there. Uh, in the second example, we've got function name and data. Uh, so this is how we call something. So we're going to call a function uh, called function name, and we're going to pass it an argument, which is data, which just has a name. Um, and if we want to define a function, we, again, we use, uh, um, so if we want to define a piece of data or a value and give it a name, we just use the def. Um, and uh, we can also use, we're actually going to use keywords in maps as well, so be able to use a keyword as a lookup, essentially. If we want to look up a value, we can use a keyword to very easily look up that specific value. And we can also chain uh, uh, data together. We can also change our, chain our functions together. So we're using this little um, uh, syntactic sugar enclosure in, in called a threading macro. And this allows us to take uh, the result of this function and give it to the, uh, the next function as an argument. And then the result of this function call will go to the next function. So that's pretty much all the syntax we're going to cover. And there's not much more syntax you need to, you'll, you'll learn in Clojure anyway. It's a very tiny little syntax um, for the language. Uh, and one of the really nice things is that uh, Clojure tries, encourages uh, immutability, uh, and one way it does that is by having what we call a persistent data structures. Uh, so it's got four built-in data structures as a list, as a vector, which is like an array, uh, as a map, which is uh, like a hash map, uh, and a set, which just means uh, all the values within the set are unique. You can't have the same value uh, in the set as well. And the really nice thing is well, when you create these things, just like you would create um, like a string in Java. When you create a string in Java, it's immutable. You can't change it. If you actually want to update that chain, update the string, you're actually creating a new object underneath. And the same thing is happening with these lists. So if you create a list of one, two, three, four, and you want to add five to it, 
you can't actually change that original list. What it does is actually returns a new list of one, two, three, four, five. And you might think that's very inefficient, especially if you've got a large uh, list or a large vector, but it's actually using, Clojure uses uh, these uh, shared memory. So if you run a function o over a data structure and it generates a new, f a new data structure, a new list or a new vector, uh, if there are common values, it's going to share the memory. So if you've got a, a collection of, say, 10,000 elements uh, and you add uh, another 10 to it, it's not going to create a second uh, data structure with 10,010 elements. It's going to create another data structure with 10 elements and links back to the original uh, like 10,000 uh, elements in the original vector. So let's give that as an example. I'm going to go into an editor now. So this is uh, Emacs. Uh, you don't have to use Emacs for uh, Clojure, but quite a lot of people do. Uh, it's just a, a, an example of an editor that's Clojure aware, which means I can actually run code and evaluate exactly what it does straight away. So I'm running what we call a REPL, um, which is a read, evaluate, print loop, which is basically the, the, the dynamic runtime for Clojure. So I've got a so example here. I've got I've, we've done the pure functions um, and the impure functions. Uh, so we'll skip over those. Uh, uh, but, but where are we go. Uh, what was going to show? Yeah. So we've got some uh, persistence. Where is my example gone? I've lost my example now. Oop. Oops. There we go. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so that's the one. So I've got a, I'm just going to evaluate that. And so that's now in memory. That's That persistent vector name uh, is the name for 0 to 4 uh, for my data structure. Uh, so now I can actually uh, do things with that name. And it will, it will update the data structure. But it, what it actually does is generates a new data structure. So. I can change it, or I can give the appearance of changing data. But what actually happens if I look at persistent vector itself, it's still 0 to 4. I haven't actually changed it. But when I, when I conj 5 to it, uh, I'm, I'm changing. Uh, given the appearance, I'm changing something, but I'm actually not. It's actually an uh, immutable value, but I'm returning a new result. Uh, and so that way, it's very easy for uh, you to run programs very, very massively parallel because they're not interfering with each other. We've got this value that we're passing around, uh, and we're not changing it. And each function that comes across that gets the original value. It doesn't get something that's changed by something else. So again, every part of your code is a lot more easy to reason about. Uh, and if we want to, yeah, so if we take the persistent value and uh, we add 6 to it, so here we've got 0 to 4 and then 6. But again, we haven't changed the underlying data structure. Uh, can everybody see that at the back? Yes, no, maybe. Let's make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, and if we wanted to um, see, we wanted to conch five and six together. So here we're using the threading macro to, um, to work on persistent vector. Uh, and then we're going to just add five to it and add six to it. And so if we, we now get a, a data structure of zero to six. But again, the original one hasn't changed. We've still got uh, 0 to 4. So you can actually pass information around uh, with inside Clojure without actually affecting other aspects of your, uh, of your code. Um, yeah. So let's look at some higher order functions. Again, I'll go back to uh, Emacs. Um, so we've got things like uh, sequence and list comprehension. So I can generate, I can generate data very easily, uh, and I can filter through that data as well. So just to walk through this, uh, I've got to, I'm going to generate a range of numbers um, from uh, zero to nine, uh, and then I'm going to actually um, filter them all out. So when when they're odd, uh, I'm going to return those values, and when they're even, I'm going to ignore them. So when I evaluate that, I just get the, the odd numbers out of the list I'm generating. And the same thing, I can get the uh, even numbers. Um, uh, so in this case, I'm using while. So while the, the numbers are even, I'm going to return them. And when they stop being even, I'm going to stop returning any values. 
So the, fir the, only, the first value we come to in 0 to 9, uh, which is even, is 0. So after that, it actually stops. So it's very easy to, um, to generate information and deal with a lot of data in Clojure as well. So actually generating um, lists and, and values in, in data uh, in, in Clojure is very, very easy. And it's a very data-orientated language as well. So instead of thinking in terms of objects and um, uh, you're thinking more in terms of these data structures that you're passing around and the functions that you're actually going to use on top of them. Uh, and there's some really cool stuff like lazy evaluation. So what do you think uh, 22 divided by 7 actually evaluates to? Any guesses? Pi. Close, which is 3.14. Actually, in closure, it's 22 over 7. Um, and the reason why it's still 22 over 7 is because uh, if we actually divide 22 by 7, we get uh, a, a decimal number. Uh, but how many decimal points do we actually want? We might not know at this time. So we keep the precision of this calculation in place until we actually know the, the value that we actually want. So if we, if we just want a simple uh, decimal number, we can just say, we can just instead of dividing by 7, we can divide by 7.0. Uh, uh, and that gives us a context in which to evaluate that, um, uh, that number. And um, we can also specify like, whether we want a double or a float as well. So there are, there are types underneath um, uh, closure, but we don't need to define these types. We can coerce types. We can specify types as and when we need to. But typically, you don't actually need to define any types at all. You're, if you're defining types, it's, it's, it's essentially your data structures are becoming your types, the, the information that you're passing around your system. And it just makes it really easy for you to, uh, uh, again, to reason with it. Because if you've got a very nice, clear data structure, you can understand what you might be doing, what kind of algorithms you're actually going to run. So if you've got um, a whole bunch of uh, portfolios, like stock numbers, and you can kind of reason that you're actually going to be dealing with uh, the stock exchange and, and transactions and so on. Uh, and we talked about immutability briefly. Uh, so again, if I create a string, then that string is, is, can't be changed. Um, it, we'd actually create a new string. Um, in this case, because we're running on the host on the Java platform, it's actually using the, uh, the Java, uh, Java string. So we do type. Um, we pull that in. Uh, let me go back to the end. So we can see. So we can see it's actually you can see the the actual hosted platform underneath. And if we're running on uh, JavaScript or .NET, then we would see uh, a different uh, type that we're using as well. And so we're defining names. So you can actually you can actually redefine the name. So when you're actually changing, uh, when you're actually in the developer mode, you can actually change uh, the names of things. So here I've, def I've defined uh, name of value. And it's got a string, but I can actually go in. Uh, I can actually go in and actually change it, um, and and that will update. So that's basically injecting uh, a new uh, version of that uh, that name uh, into my running program. So just like with Clo with JavaScript, you can actually inject new JavaScript code into your uh, live running program and get the same thing with. Um, with closure, in, thanks to the REPL. When, you run, when you're doing this, obviously, at runtime, it's not a common practice. I mean, if you, you could actually go in and fix a bug without bringing your system down. Uh, if, you, uh, if you attached a REPL to your running program, to your running production program. But again, it's not encouraged to go and fix things in production. Hopefully, you, you will do that uh, without having to just do a quick hack in production. Uh, but it is possible. And. Um, Local assignment is also immutable as well. And uh, so here we've got, uh, I'm just using a library called closure string. And I've, I'm just defining a couple of functions that do some stuff. So I'm going to take a sentence uh, called code motion Amsterdam. And this is just a little function that uh, uses an alphabet, which I've defined uh, down below, which basically converts each character into a, uh, into a code. So when I run this, I get a a code, and this this code basically is a 
not quite binary, but it's like a, a, a code for each letter. So that's, um, so we've got uh, C, O, D, M, E, code motion, and all the way through it spells code motion Amsterdam. Uh, and we, we're defining, uh, basically what we're doing is uh, defining this local uh, assignment called words, uh, and we're, we're running a function over our sentence to basically make code motion all uppercase so that our alphabet, so our alphabet is all uh, lowercase, uh, uppercase, sorry. So we're converting everything to uppercase so we can match the, the, the letters with the code and return the, uh, return the value. Uh, there we go. Uh, so this word again is immutable, so we're not changing things. So within the scope of this let function, again, we've got a, uh, a local assignment called word, and we, that can't be changed. That's, once that's created, it can't be changed, and we can use that within the scope. But once we go out the scope, then again, that's tidied away uh, in the garbage collected away in Java in this case. And we can also program with functions as well. So again, we've seen um, how to do stuff with uh, functions already. And um, we get first class functions. So we can actually use functions with other functions. So we've looked at range, uh, range 1 to 10 before. So we'll just uh, show you what that does. Um, so this is going to generate a number from 1 to 9. So it's like. 10 minus 1. Um, and uh, we can actually just run a function. So we can apply a function uh, over this range 40 called plus. So we're applying the plus function, because plus is a, an actual function, not an operator. So in, in JavaScript world and in Java, you have a, an operator precedence. If you, look, if you go and look at the JavaScript operator precedence, you'll be there for a, probably a day trying to understand all of it. There's about there's about uh, 50, 60 different uh, combinations of order preference, uh, operator precedence. Uh, in Clojure, you don't need to because you've got this, uh, everything is a function, and you've got this prefix notation, which makes it nice and clear for you to, um, um, to see, basically, uh, the order. So we're going to apply this function over the result of uh, running range 40, uh, which we get that number four as well. And reduce kind of does the same thing as well. So we can basically take a collection of numbers and, re and, and reduce them by applying a function to it. So instead of having uh, a range of uh, 0 to 9, we're basically going to add all those numbers together. And again, it, by using functions with functions, it makes it really easy to uh, compose uh, algorithms with these functions. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, that's just cons. I think we've seen examples of that. Uh, functors. So again, and another thing, uh, another example of that is so mapping something as well. So we've seen this before, where we've mapped um, a value. So we map this function. So this could be any function. This could be a function that's built in, or it could be our own function as well. So we're going to take a function and we're going to go over each of these values in our collection, and we're going to apply that function individually. Whereas previously, what we were doing is uh, using, this, um, uh, using this plus function uh, with all of the uh, collection as arguments. So we're adding them up. So it's very easy to uh, kind of apply functions in different ways and get uh, the result you're looking for. Uh, how are we doing for time? Ooh. I'm going to be about. I'm going to run over about 10 minutes because we started about 10 minutes late. And there's uh, you can do things like polymorphism. So again, Clojure isn't an object-oriented language, but there's uh, things like polymorphism, which, um, which is quite nice and quite useful uh, aspect uh, that is also in OO as well. Um, so if we just call this function uh, I am poly uh, and we don't give it any arguments, it's actually going to run this first uh, line of code. Uh, if we give it an argument, then it's going to run a different algorithm. So we can basically have a function that does two different things based on uh, the argument it's received. So if I just run poly, I am poly by itself, it just gives a simple name. And if I do it with uh, an argument, it's actually returning the string. So it's giving a different function. It's the same function I'm calling, but with a different argument, I get a different result. And here's another example as well, which is just basically 
summing things up. So basically, this is like a, 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 a numerator. So it's kind of going to sum all these numbers together. If I, um, it's using this uh, kind of local uh, uh, variable val, as local, local assignment vals of zero, which is basically an accumulator. So if we don't give it an accumulator uh, like here, so here we're going to basically start uh, our, uh, our summing of these numbers at nine instead of zero. If we don't give it an argument, then we're going to start at zero. So here in these first two examples, we give it, we're just passing the numbers that we want to sum up. In the third example, we're actually summing uh, from uh, the, the nine. So if we see what the, oops, wrong button. So if we see what the results are, so summing up 2, 7, 9, 11, and 13 comes to 42. Uh, but if we say, well, we actually want to start summing up from uh, 9 instead of 0, then we've actually got 49 as well. Have I got that right? Oh, I've missed the 2 off. That's why. Whoops. That's why it's not quite right. There we go. Uh, so we actually get 51. So we get 9 more than what we got originally because we're, we're passing this extra value in. Uh, and that's being used as this accumulating total, uh, rather than uh, if we don't pass that, then we do the first uh, function call as well. And you can also do uh, really big uh, sums as well. So here we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so yeah, about 10 million uh, uh, numbers we want to sum up. And the only difference with this sum and the previous sum is we're using this uh, recur function, which is calling sum uh, just like it did before. So here, we're actually calling sum. We've got some recursion coming. So we're actually going to call sum um, by, itse uh, by itself with uh, the, first, the rest of the values plus the first value. And that's going to basically iterate around our collection and give us the result. Now, if we do that really, really big number, eventually we'll blow up our, our stack. And we've got 10 minutes left. Woo. Um, uh, but if I use this recur function instead, it's the same as writing sum here, except what it's going to do is each time it does the calculation, it's going to overwrite the memory, because it's the old calculation is kind of done because we're passing the result of that old calculation back to itself. Uh, and this is basically saying it'll just reuse the memory that we don't need anymore. And that way, it won't blow up, hopefully. If it does, then it'll be a lot less than 10 minutes. Uh, it might take a few seconds for it to calculate. Well, there you go. So I can calculate really big numbers without having to worry about blowing up my, my heap size. And state. So all the things we've done so far is actually without changing any state whatsoever. And the nice thing about Clojure is it allows you to do most, if not all, of your code without actually having to change state. It might look like you're changing state, but you're just returning a different value. You can't actually change state. You can actually change the values that are in memory locations by using uh, something called an atom. So I can define, uh, uh, here we're just defining an empty vector, uh, which is the square brackets. Uh, but I'm wrapping it around something called an atom. And that means that if I change this, if I run a function over this value, it will actually change the memory location, the value that's in that particular memory location, rather than returning uh, a new value. And here we're just putting in a value that's, here we're putting in something called a validator, which just basically says, I don't want to have more than two players added to uh, my game. So I'm just going to have like a two player game uh, that I'm defining here. So um, I'm defining a little function called join game. And basically, it's going to uh, take the uh, names, and it's basically going to uh, swap the values uh, that's currently in the players, which is our data structure, uh, with the name that we've passed in as an argument. So when we do join game Rachel, then we've actually got Rachel joining uh, the game. And if I wanted to go and have a look at what's in players, I can now see that Rachel has joined. Um, so we can see that Rachel is now part of that uh, uh, data structure called players. And then if I do Harriet, uh, then we've got two players. And then if I try and do uh, Terry, then that's going to complain. Uh, yeah, I'm complaining because I've got an invalid reference state because I put that condition on our data structure that we can't have more than two players. 
So again, we've still got, oops, wrong button. So many keys on your two fingers, there we go. Um, and so here we can also, uh, if we want to do more of a uh, transactional uh, thing uh, with our code as well, if we're going to change multiple things at once, uh, we can also use uh, a ref instead of an atom. So again, we've, we've got players ref, which is just like our players. We've got an empty uh, collection, which is in the vector, uh, and we're just using ref uh, instead of atom. So again, we're going to mutate uh, the state. We're actually going to change the values. Um, so here we're going to set up a game account with uh, 1,000 uh, euros, uh, and we're going to uh, create an account for Harriet, which doesn't have any uh, money in whatsoever. And then when somebody joins, uh, we're going to define a way to join the game. And when you join the game, you're actually going to, um, uh, going to uh, get 100 euros so that we can encourage you to gamble all your money away and then pay even more money when you're hooked. Uh, and then obviously, we're going to decrement the game account so we actually know how much we've been uh, losing or winning uh, for us as well, because obviously if we're giving away too much, then we might want to give away less. If we're making lots of money, then we might want to give away more to encourage more people to play. And so now I can join the game uh, safely, and it's going to update um, Harriet's account. So Harriet's account is going to be 100. Uh, then the game account's going to be uh, 900. And we've still got the players. In this case, the player is just Harriet as well. So it allows us. Uh, to basically have this atomic um, uh, atomic change of state without having to worry about um, like locking information as well. And so a lot of this stuff is all the uh, mutating uh, part of Clojure is done inside something called the software transactional memory. And it's basically, uh, it's basically like having a, an, an ACID database, an atomic database inside uh, Clojure running for you. So if you want to change a value, this software transactional memory makes sure that nothing else is trying to change the same value at the same time, just like you would do with a database. Uh, and I've got five minutes left, which is about all I've got time for to do a closure script stuff. So it allows a safe way to change your uh, code, uh, change your values inside there uh, when, they're, when they're mutable. OK, I'm going to do um, some other stuff now. Where is it? Uh, so, oh yeah, this is just, uh, again, a quick exercise, putting some of that stuff together. So I'm going to pull in a book, all the text of a book, and some English words as well. And I've commented some of these lines out. So if I just look at the book itself, then I get uh, the text of the book. Uh, and it's just, in this case, it's just The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is an excellent book if you uh, like sci-fi stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to basically uh, uncomment this first function, which is going to take the book and convert it all into um, uh, individual words. So we've got all the individual words of the book in, uh, in a list. Uh, then I want to see, I'm basically trying to work out what the, um, what the frequencies are of uh, the, all the words in there. I want to find the most common, uh, the most popular word inside the book. Uh, oops. Uh, oh, wrong one. Uh, so I can now see the values, how, how often the, uh, the, the words are in, but they're not sorted. So let's sort by values. So let's sort by uh, the value of stuff. And let's actually reverse it as well, because I know that it's going to, uh, I want to see the most popular word. Uh, so I want to see that at the top. And strangely enough, the most popular word in an English language book is the. Who'd have guessed? Uh, so let's remove all those common words, um, and uh, then we can uh, see what's going on. So, boom, boom, boom. Uh, so we've got I as the most common word. Uh, that's annoying, because uh, I should be taken out by the common words. If we look at the common words here, um, we can see the, oops, wrong one. Uh, we can actually see that they're all lowercase. Uh, so if I basically turn everything to lowercase in the book. Uh, boom, boom, uh, boom. Then we've got uh, our answer. So the, the most popular name, uh, most popular word in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is Arthur, which is one of the main characters. So that's not really surprising. So again, we can, uh, we can basically just uh, play around with the combination of these functions to see uh, and to like, determine what our 
uh, result is and to, to see if we've got our program right as well. So it's a very easy way to use the REPL to basically determine what's actually going on with your application. And it's a great way to really quickly design your application. So not only is the code correct, but it also does the right things as well because we can see the results. And just a final example of that is um, I'm going to do a little bit of closure scripts. Um, so I'm just going to get in here. Uh, so there's a, a little project gone called Flappy Birds. You might have heard of Flappy Birds before. I didn't write this, but I've just played around with this. And um, so if we go to Flappy Birds, uh, that's me hacking around with Flappy Birds, uh, which is, uh, let's just change that back again. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, yeah. uh, so I've just changed branches now back to, um, back to what Flappy Birds was. And uh, I can restart. So I can play the game. And um, I can see I'm not very good at it. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, but if we play up this, uh, no, we didn't. Come here. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Scripts. Flappy birds. Let's open the source. Flappy birds. Now, if we go into the code and I find collision, uh, if I can spell. Oh, no, I can't spell. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Uh, there it is. Let's just comment that out. That'll make it a lot easier to play the game. Uh, boom, boom, boom. There we go. Uh, so if I save that, uh, you can see that in the little corner, you see a little bit of a uh, closure script logo pops up. So now I can play the game uh, and actually explore it, and, and I don't have a collision to detect. So it's a lot easier to play the game. Uh, and this is how Flappy Birds should be played. It should be a lot easier. I'd be playing it all day, really. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can, you can have a very interactive kind of experience. So this, what's running in the browser is actually JavaScript. What's running in my editor is Clojure. So basically, every time I save my Clojure, it's compiling into uh, um, uh, Clojure JavaScript and injecting into the browser. Uh, so it's really cool. And what I did with uh, here, just a final example. Uh, oops. Is is basically just uh, oops. Oh. Uh. There we go. And I can change it completely. Uh, just again by this is uh, me just hacking around one day, one hack day uh, with uh, some fun there as well. Oops. I've turned collision detection on. Obviously again. So it's very easy to kind of if you've ever seen like sort of the Vic, Victor. Uh, in, Brett Victor's uh, invented by principle. You can have that really interactive kind of uh, nature of game development, but also web development and any other development as well. Uh, and that's my time up. Uh, I hope you've uh, learned something, and thank you very much for listening.